Welcome, Cass. Welcome, Dick. You had a long commute. Yeah, all the way across the street. Yeah. Uh, Cass, you lived two blocks away, right? I did. Yes. How does it feel to be back at home? Great. Sentimental. <laughs> uh, well, we're glad to have you here. So this is part of, uh, it's probably worth, just for those of you who aren't familiar with BFI, uh, what BFI, the Becker Freeman Institute, tries to do is really just two things. Uh, one is build and foster and expand the tradition of Chicago economics, of uncovering new ideas uh, to help people understand the world in a different way. Uh, and the second is making sure that those ideas make it out into the broader world and not just in journals uh, that all of us uh, on the stage like to read and maybe not everyone in the room likes to read. Uh, so with that, this is part of uh, those efforts. I thought I would just begin with uh, you, Dick, and life sometimes has funny uh, coincidences, but the night you won the Nobel Prize, I'm sure there was lots of celebration that you were engaged in, uh, the poor students who were enrolled in my graduate public finance class uh, were in a small, somewhat dark room inside Say Hall listening to me lecture. Uh, and what was I lecturing on? I was lecturing on maybe not your most favorite paper, I think. Uh, a 1976 paper that you published with Sherwin Rosen, uh, The Value of Saving a Life, Evidence from the Labor Market. Uh, and in that paper you talk about individuals making very finely tuned judgments about trade-offs uh, between money and exposing them to fatality risks. And in some sense, really capture like homo economicus. Uh, now that seems like it's something you didn't stick with very well. Uh, and I wondered with the perspective of a couple decades, if you could tell us, A, what went on in that paper and kind of what happened? You seem to be on such an interesting path. <laughs> Well, I can tell you I was a great disappointment to Sherwin Rosen, who was uh, my co-author on that paper and my advisor, and a very traditional Chicago Indeed. economist. And I, I kept telling him that if he wasn't nice to me, I would write a book and say he taught me everything he knew. <laughs> so uh, that made him nicer. Um, so... you. You have to understand, at the time I wrote that, I was actually teaching a course in cost-benefit analysis. And I got to the section about value of a life. Yeah. And the method at that time, so this is the mid-70s, was if 100 people are going to die, you add up an estimate of the human capital for each one. Their and wages. Uh, well, the present value yeah, of their the future value wages, wages. Yeah. Uh, uh, which means killing off old guys like me is a, a plus, <laughs> uh, because not only am I not contributing, but, you know, there's a lot of Social Security and yeah. Medicare and... Stuff. So, so even, yeah. you know, when I was a young man, I thought this was a pretty stupid way of doing things. But nobody had a better way. Tom Schelling had written an article suggesting the right concept would be how much would people pay to have the world safer. But nobody had figured out a way to do this. I, I thought of Russian roulette. You know, you invite people to the lab and you have, a, you have one of these like AK-47, <laughs> let's say it has 100 chambers, yeah. <laughs> and um, the, the N of them are full, and then you ask people how much they would pay to remove a bullet. Yeah. That's the right conceptual exercise. <laughs> With highlighting uh, the differences IRB between e economics and really regular people. Yes. <laughs> maybe with the provost is here, maybe we can finally get this experiment to prove. But, talk to the IRB. Yeah, I'll talk to the IRB. So um, my father was an actuary, and uh, I asked him, he happened to have data on occupational death rates. And he said he'd look around, and I got that. And then I got the idea to run a regression of wages on the kitchen sink and 
uh, the risk of death. And um, so that was the thesis. And you're absolutely right that it's predicated on the idea that people like the people who wash windows on tall buildings, that we should let them decide how safe to build our highways. That's the premise. Yeah, not so much. <laughs> I mean, uh, so it, it is, while I was working on that, though, I did my first behavioral experiment. So I didn't tell Sherman about this while I was doing it. I asked people two questions. I suppose by coming to this lecture, you've been exposed to a rare fatal disease. There's a one in a thousand chance you're going to die. A quick and painless death next week. But we have a cure right here in this glass. How much would you pay for that cure? So how much would you pay to take one bullet out of the gun uh, with a thousand chambers? Then that was question one. Question two, we're running some experiments on this disease over at the hospital. We need volunteers. All you have to do is expose yourself to a one in a thousand risk of dying. How much would you have to be paid? Now, economic theory says the answer should be approximately the same. And the answers I got were wildly different. People would say, oh, I'd pay a thousand dollars for that cure, but I wouldn't do that experiment. Maybe a third of the people say they wouldn't do it for any amount of money. And uh, the ones who answer give answers orders of magnitude bigger. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So to answer your question of how would I do it now, I used to say that I would ask Howard Rafa. Now, he's dead, unfortunately. <laughs> but uh, he was like the guru of decision analysis. And I think that's some version of my answer, is uh, and rather than, and you know, Cass, don't listen to this part. So <laughs> rather than using these numbers, so that little paper we wrote, some version of that is used every day in Cass's old office that's required to do cost-benefit analyses on things like uh, emitting pollution yeah. and yeah. yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't go with that number, but I don't have a great alternative. It's not adding up human capital. And I think asking pe smart people to think about it and maybe base it on some data is probably what I would do now. But you were the main, what set you off is you were bugged by that there was this prediction uh, that the willingness to accept and the willingness to pay should be the same, and you didn't, that, that didn't fit what you saw. Yeah, and, and then as, as I went along... Because, because what Dick's not, he's making kind of clear, is like he was raised in a very homo economicus yeah. way. Oh, absolutely. When so I that must, him, must, have, you must, it must have been the secret from Sherwin. Oh, I, I, I told him about it, and he said, stop <laughs> wasting your time. Yeah go back to writing Fortran programs, <laughs> which is not my comparative advantage, actually. <laughs> so, uh, so I discovered uh, that finding puzzling behavior, I'm better at that than writing code. Chaos. Uh, we're going to get to nudge in a minute, which people are dying to hear about. Uh, but I just wanted to talk about your new book for a minute, The Cost-Benefit Revolution. <clears throat> which you wrote uh, in the, today's kind of turbulent political environment, the issues that most divide us are fundamentally about facts rather than values. Uh, and you said if we get clear on the facts, the value disagreement starts to seem uninteresting. Uh, I wondered if you wanted to talk about that a little bit. Okay, so... And I guess I could just try to be obnoxious and say we can't even agree on how many people showed up to the inauguration of our president, so... Okay, so, uh, Most of us are not confused about that. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Have you looked at the polling? 
on Republicans versus Democrats on that question? Yeah. <laughs> so, so people think they disagree sharply about occupational safety and health and food safety and clean air. And in Washington, as through the country, these issues have different valences across political lines. And it seems like a different value uh, assessment is driving these judgments. Uh, but here's a question for you. Suppose there's a food safety proposal that's going to cost $2 billion and save three lives a year. Is that a good idea? No matter how enthusiastic you are about food safety, it's unlikely that you'd like that idea. Here's another one. There's a occupational safety and health regulation that's going to save 600 lives a year, prevent 600 cancer deaths, and the cost is $500 million. You're really going to have to lowball the value of the statistical life not to embrace that. And I saw in Washington time and again uh, progressives retreat, uh, not with sadness, but with an acknowledgment where the facts showed that the proposal they thought they liked was extremely expensive and it wasn't going to do a lot of good. And uh, conservatives uh, embrace regulatory initiatives when they saw the human consequences were on that excellent. So often people use as a cue some simple question, like is this the federal government regulating clean air? But once they engage the question, which it may be particulate matter, which is a quite <coughs> dangerous air pollutant, where reducing it from X, let's say, to something a little below X, it's going to save a lot of lives, and it's not going to have a big economic hit. So that people are, in their reflective moments, cost-benefit analysts. And once they are, they are engaging in facts. So I could, I, the one time I called a member of Congress after the Obama administration issued a rule, I called one who really despised the Obama administration, but who had written a letter which was substantive and factual, giving uh, 12 points of objection to an air pollution rule. And I called him up and I said, uh, we got your letter. Of the 12 points, actually, seven of them were good. And we responded in whole or in part. And five, we didn't agree with. And here's exactly why. And I spelled it out, not with reference to values, just by reference to human consequences. And his answer, and I won't betray his confidence and disclose his name, but someone who really hated the Obama administration, he said, uh, oh, this sounds good. I'm persuaded. I'm going to issue a press release endorsing what you did. He never issued that press release. <laughs> <laughs> I think the reason is he got back to his staff, and his staff said, you can't do that. Uh, but he didn't issue a negative press release. And to this day, he hasn't said a single negative word about that rule. And it's because once the facts were laid bare, there was basically no daylight between the most left-wing people in the Obama <coughs> administration and this right-wing critic. OK, that's great. Just, and you're at the university. One, one so, little yeah, footnote yeah. to that. Notice that we, we don't have to agree on what the precise number should be for a value of a life. But the flawed number that you come up with using the method we have, say it's $10 million a life. Uh, that may be wrong, but at least we won't value some at $300 and some at $300 billion. Across and, and different regulations. A, yeah. Across yeah. different fields. Yeah. And, and, and that was like one of the big achievements that CAS achieved in, yeah. uh, in Washington. Um, it was just one follow-up on that. But let's just suppose that there's people who are not as good public-spirited as you suggest. Uh, and view cost-benefit analysis as like, uh, we call it a degree of freedom. Uh, and they can insert whatever number they want in there. Does that, you know, what, you know, what happens if not everyone's playing by the same rules? Okay, good. Well, okay, the, the direction we're going is a pretty technocratic conception of democracy. Yeah. And uh, we have a moral heart to the technocratic conception of democracy. And it goes back to John Stuart Mill, who was a founder of utilitarianism and an ethicist, who, to my, I've read a great deal of Mill. I only read him self-evidently angry once. And it's, it's an amazing passage where he's saying that the critics of utilitarianism seldom have the decency to acknowledge 
that the utility that matters is not that of a single person or the person who's arguing for utilitarianism, but is the uh, utility of all of us. And then Mill most uncharacteristically says, the morality of utilitarianism is the morality of Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, in his golden rule, you can find the entirety of the utilitarian ethic. And it's an extremely powerful passage uh, unifying Christian ethics with a pretty technical conception of what, how to think about what government should be doing. Now, if people are representing interest groups or using <coughs> intuitions that misfire or being expressive rather than focused on what's actually affecting human beings, the only thing that can be done is to talk to them. And in some domains, that doesn't work. But I'm here to tell you, in Republican and Democratic administrations, the degree of uniformity with respect to on-the-ground stuff crushes the degree of admittedly important interest group or value-based disagreement, at least in the terrains we're now discussing, health, safety, and in the environment. Excellent. OK, uh, I thought we might turn to the book that you guys worked on together, the famously. New one, the new one or the old one? Well, I don't know about the new one. Casket's so excited at the idea of a new book. Yeah. And you know, if you, if you slip during a dinner conversation, <laughs> the next thing you know, you have a book contract. Yeah. So, <laughs> so. We have a well, book contract. Not, not everyone is able to generate a book no, contract. He, you know, he, he yeah. can, and then the book will be done next week. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so in this book, you guys set out a case uh, for what you call libertarian paternalism. Uh, the libertarian part, you write, the libertarian aspect of our strategies lies in the straightforward insistence that in general, people should be free to do what they like and to opt out of undesirable arrangements if they want to do so. Uh, the paternalism part lies in the claim that it's legitimate for choice architects, we're going to come back to that, uh, to try to influence people's behavior in order to make their lives longer, healthier, uh, and better. So. Probably everyone here has read the book five or six times, uh, but for the one or two people who haven't, uh, could you guys give an example of what you had in mind uh, by yeah. all that and where you would recommend a nudge? So, uh, yeah, let me give you an example that actually uh, relates to uh, how uh, we stumbled on that phrase. So, um, a former student of mine, Shlomo Benarzi, and I, created something that we called Save More Tomorrow. And it's kind of the next step after automatic enrollment. And the idea is you go to people and say, you probably realize you're not saving enough. How about if we sign you up to increase your contributions? Not today, because you can't afford it, but in a few months when you get a raise, because we all have more self-control in the future. So that, that was the idea. And we got some local company, actually, to try this. And we invited people to join this. This wasn't automatically enrolled. This was opt-in. And the people who opted in tripled their saving rates. So I was presenting a paper about this over at a conference in honor of Sherwin, who died prematurely. And my discussant was your colleague, Casey Mulligan. Oh, I think I was at that conference. And he was <laughs> sort of stammering a little uh, because the results are really strong. And he says, uh, finally, he says, yeah, the results are pretty good, but, but isn't this paternalism? Like, you know, cutting me to the, <laughs> And um, I said, well, I don't know. There's no coercion here, right? People volunteer for this, like joining a bowling league, you know? So uh, I don't know. If, it, if this is paternalism, it must be some different kind of paternalism. I don't know what we could call it. Maybe libertarian paternalism. And 
That infuriated Casey. Uh, <laughs> and as infuriated virtually all true blue libertarians, because we stole their word. But um, the next day, I think, uh, Cass and I were having lunch down the street at Noodles, which is where we wrote the book, basically. <laughs> and um, I've eaten there. I can see why you'd write a book there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, Cass isn't that into food. Let's just say that. <laughs> but, um, uh, it's a necessity, yeah. you know. So uh, I said, Cass, you know, I told him this story. I said, I came up with an interesting phrase yesterday. I think there might be something to this. And that, you know, then I, we wrote like an eight-page paper in the AEA proceedings that I drafted. And then Cass turned it into a 90-page law review article. <laughs> that I haven't really read. <laughs> <laughs> but, right. but you so, kind of know what it's about. But I kind of know what it's about. I have a lot of, a lot of footnotes. So, a lot of footnotes. But this, you know. This well, hold on, no, wait, okay. I, can I, I'm just gonna interrupt. It, it just feels like we're getting one side of the story here. Well, <laughs> I don't know why you think that. But uh, anyway, that looked like a book to me. And uh, then I may have mentioned the B word. And uh, then, uh, yeah, we had a book. Cass? Your version. Well, OK, so uh, <laughs> uh, think of uh, a GPS device as uh, a mechanism that preserves freedom of choice, but also steers people in a direction that they have specified. So a GPS device is libertarian paternalism in two senses. First, it's respectful of people's decisions about their own preferred destination. They set their dis destination. So it's means paternalistic. And second, allows people to say, I don't like the direction in which you want me to go. I have a route that I consider scenic or nostalgic or fun. So it is means paternalism, respectful of destination, and choice preserving. Now those are defining of things like calorie labels, which the Trump administration has recently embraced, uh, automatic voter registration, which a number of voters have uh, recently supported and which Americans broadly are for, where you don't have to be a voter. If you're automatically registered as a voter, you can opt out. Uh, there is a program from which uh, over 10 million American children who are poor are benefiting, which is automatic enrollment in uh, free lunch and dinners, lunch and breakfast, if you are poor. And there's automatic enrollment, so they don't have to sign up. And they can opt out, either explicitly or by just not taking advantage of the program. Um, information disclosure of multiple kinds, warnings and reminders have that feature. And one reason the health example, which Dean Miles gave, is so, uh, I think, powerful is there are, there's a pen and now at Harvard uh, nudge units, basically, which are using behaviorally informed policies, including just sending reminders to patients or changing the default number of opioids that people are given or making it so that when you are released from an emergency room, if you are uh, an opioid addict, you automatically get uh, a medicine which has an 80% uh, success rate in curing opioid addiction. And these are all completely choice-preserving approaches. But in some cases, the number of lives being saved is quite high. And in other cases, the health benefits are, are through the roof. But in all of these cases, we are not imposing a mandate or a ban. Uh, consistent with Mill's prescription in On Liberty, if people want to go their own way, they're entitled to. OK, so it seems like you guys don't like mandates and bans. Uh, and then you've described a bunch of cases that seem. In most cases, we think murder should be yeah. banned. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you want to hold on to the libertarian part of the thing, so yeah, yeah. want to only limited okay, use so of bans. Consistent but, with the standard libertarian view, if there's harm to others, then there's a case for a mandate or a prohibition. 
And it's also the case, I would say, that if there's a demonstrated self-control problem where the benefits of the mandate crush the costs, as in the case of mandatory seatbelt buckling, or I think in the case of cigarette taxes, then, then the presumption in favor of freedom of choice uh, might be overcome. But you need a strong empirical demonstration where you don't have harm to others. Okay, but so where do we get into a gray area? There's some space between a bunch that are unobjectionable, uh, and then people complain, well, wait a minute, choice architecture. Who got to set the architecture? Uh, and what's the criteria for setting the architecture? And I'll just even pick on your terrific work on savings, not to save more tomorrow, but uh, the, with the defaults, it is true that you can get people to save more, but what that question, some, what that's, that does not seem to me an answer necessarily to the question of are they better off? Uh, well, uh, that's true. Um, so, so like the Cass had some good examples of death. We can all agree no one wants to be dead. So like things that prevent people from being dead, those seem like good. So but if, changing if we, the, whether I consume today or I consume tomorrow, right? It's but it's harder we, to figure that one out. So um, a friend of ours happens to be here. That we were at a conference this morning. Uh, Illinois has passed a law that's going to make it easier for people who have jobs where their employer doesn't offer a savings plan to have payroll saving, which is the only way people really effectively save. If you look at the people who don't have this and how much they've saved, it's pitiful. Now, it, it, look, it's possible some of them are going to come into a big inheritance or are planning to win the lottery. But if you see a 50-year-old that has a total of $3,000 saved, you know, it's a good guess that that's too little. And if we can <coughs> automatically enroll them into a savings plan that they can opt out of, uh, they save a lot more. So <coughs> the question of who should be the choice architect in many cases, it's, it's the government or it's the employer. Um, the provost and I have had interesting conversations about the healthcare plans that the university offers and how they should be presented. And I think um, we could make people much better off by changing the choice architecture. But so far, uh, uh, the president and provost haven't put me in charge of that. <laughs> so so, so uh, people, you know, whoever's in charge is, gets to be in charge of the choice architecture. Okay, so there are two different questions, I think. One is, how do we know which choice architecture is best? And that's a question of what promotes people's welfare. And that might be easy, as in some of the cases. It might be hard in others. But there's another, which is, I think, a more fundamental objection that some people make, which is, where do these choice architects get off being choice architects at all? Isn't the very idea presumptuous and illiberal in the sense of authoritarian or something? That objection is, uh, on this view, in, uh, not convincing, because choice architecture isn't avoidable. If you are automatically enrolled in a savings program, that's one form. If you aren't, that's another form. If there is a website, it's going to have a design. A grocery store has a choice architecture. Uh, any entity is unavoidably involved in creating a choice ac uh, architecture for those things over which the entity has jurisdiction. So it's a good question, what should the choice architecture look like? It's not a good question, Ch choice architecture, question mark. <laughs> it's better to say choice architecture, exclamation point. <laughs> and then we get to the right question. Here. Right, it's the same with architecture. So this is, <laughs> you, this is, this is a new auditorium. Uh, we couldn't, the lab school couldn't have said Let's have an auditorium. 
they had to decide how big it should be and how much it's going to cost and where the doors should be and how, how the seating should be arranged. You can't have n neutral architecture. It has to be something or the building won't stand Okay, up. excellent. Now I'm going to break the confidence of Cass's marriage here. You ready? Uh, I doubt it. <laughs> His wife, who I know, and I, I only know this from Cass, not from her, uh, claims that Cass ruined movie popcorn for her. By telling Ralph Hattening it is? Yes, by telling Ralph Hattening. So what if the nudges make people worse? Oh, so there are two, two different points. First is... <laughs> I'm, I'm taping this. <laughs> You could have a nudge that is nudging people in bad directions. It happens all the time. Yeah. Private self-interested entities or private altruistic entities. In the first case, not a mistake, but harmful. In the second case, harmful. Governments may nudge in ways that make people worse off, either because they're incompetent or because they're self-interested or evil. So that is absolutely true and really important. You might want a cost-benefit executive order, to pull an example out of a hat, as a constraint on mistaken nudging. Or you might want... But would they have captured that uh, Samantha finds okay, it uh, okay, uh, burdensome uh, to uh, know uh, the number of calories in movie popcorn? The popcorn power example, which is uh, when we worked in the government, we worked on calorie labeling as a, a nudge. It's part of the Affordable Care Act, not a part that is creating much... Uh, across political lines opposition and uh, we proposed not to include movie theaters and, and, uh, <laughs> and the, the Samantha reason, Power we were, uh, 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 exemption the, the, the reason was we, we weren't sure about whether the law authorized it and we didn't have the data so we didn't know enough um, the consensus was about the public health and cost benefit consequences but I thought we maybe wanted to include movie theaters because the legal question wasn't at all clear and we wanted to get public comments on whether to include movie theaters such that we'd leave that option available when the final decision was made. After I left the government, uh, the, the information all came in and the choice was to include movie theaters. And again, the Trump administration has followed that. Uh, I sent a note to Ambassador Power saying with enthusiasm they chose to include movie theaters. And she sent me a three-word email back Cass ruined popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's an idea there, which is that there may be a, uh, a, what's the right word, hedonic adverse effect of being nudged. So you might see something, caloric content of popcorn, or some, inf some warning about something, and that might make you uh, sad. And that has, to be, that has to be part of the all things considered judgment about whether it's a good idea. Okay. Uh, thank You're you. You're not going to ruin their marriage. <laughs> <laughs> At least not that way. <laughs> um, so one of the great appeals of nudges, I think, is that they, at least at a high level, offer something for nothing in many instances. Uh, some yeah. socially desirable outcome that doesn't cost some very many resources, maybe some extra ink on the side of the popcorn box or something like that. Um, but some problems are really big, uh, and you don't have a lot of time to act. And I wonder, like, is this, so this should go into the toolkit, I assume both of you think, uh, but, you know, how big of an arrow is this one? Uh, mixing metaphors here. And, uh, you know, an obvious example is there's been great, in the area that I work in, there's been great really an enormous amount of interest in a couple of articles uh, that have demonstrated that if you show people how much energy their neighbors are using, uh, they'll consume at least temporarily a little less energy. Uh, and I, people love it, and I think they love it because it appears to be basically free. Uh, but I think also the effects aren't that big. So I wondered, like, how big is this, this tool in the tool chest? Well, remember, uh in a bad year, 10 million children are having meals to which they're legally entitled as a result of automatic enrollment. That's 10 million children, that's a statistic. If outside of this room there was a very small fraction and you saw them as you left, I think there wouldn't be a dry eye in the house, and that's 10 million. 
the uh, savings from the Credit Card Act of 2009, the annual savings, uh, are estimated at over $10 billion also. That's a product of either nudges or behaviorally informed interventions. And that multiple billion dollar annual savings is concentrated among people with poor credit ratings. So these are fellow citizens who are, uh, through inadvertence or inattention or unrealistic optimism, uh, stuck losing significant sums of money on their credit card, and the credit card law is helping them and we're speaking of billions of dollars. The automatic enrollment program for savings, uh, the aggregate number of dollars in those programs, Dick, you may know, but it's, it's in the tens of billions also. So for a wide range of <coughs> problems, voter registration, automatic enrollment, uh, if we want to lowball the estimate, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people who are voters like that. And that's not in incremental. Now for other things, it's a several percentage point increase, and if you can get, uh, you know, if you can get an improvement in air pollution or a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, that's good. It may be that more aggressive tools are a lot better. So yeah, let me, let me follow up on that. In, in the chapter on the environment in Nudge, the first thing we say is. Step one is a carbon tax. You gotta get the prices right. Uh, but prices won't always be the most efficient way. So if we go back to savings, the tax shelter is really expensive and as best we can tell, nearly useless. So uh, Raj Chetty, not a bad economist, uh, as a paper using Danish data where they don't seem to care that much about things like data privacy. <laughs> so, um, so we've always wanted to do this test of if you get people to save more over here, do they just Undo spend? It. Yeah, and uh, in this paper with the Danish data, they find that uh, there's if, if you move from Chicago to Harvard and Harvard has a more generous retirement saving plan, you just save more there and you don't save less somewhere else. And, uh, but they estimate that the tax break, you get a penny on the dollar. It's a very powerful paper. Very so, uh, so price won't always, uh, if you give me a choice between uh, creating the right defaults and choice architecture versus a tax break in the saving domain, I'll take choice architecture every time. Oh, that was a little bit stronger than I thought you were going to say. Every time. In, in the domain of savings. Okay, in the domain of savings, all right. But ultimately, we'll judge this all. Yeah, carefully. no, yeah. I mean, uh, look, climate change is a big problem. And getting people to lower their utility bills 2% is not going to prevent what's going on in California right now. But if we get 2% for free, and we can do that 100 times, uh, it some of what we're going to accomplish is going to be in lots of incremental bits. And um, so, sure, I would, I would love to have uh, $8 gasoline. And, uh, but I'm not a politician, so I can say that. Okay, here's an environmental story. I was living in New York a few years ago, and I got a postcard in the mail that said, good news, we will switch you to green energy, which has lower greenhouse gas emissions, just go on our website and ask. And I thought, that's great, I'm gonna do it. And then I lost the postcard. <laughs> so that was choice architecture that had no effect. In Germany, there's an experiment, large scale, tens of thousands of families, where they automatically enroll people in green energy and say, you wanna opt out? and the opt-out rate is relatively small, roughly 30%. In the same design, the opt-in rate is about 7%. So 
So opt in to green energy, 7%, opt out from green energy, you end up with 70% in. So that, if generalized to areas where there is relatively inexpensive green energy, could produce very significant effects in emissions reductions. Now, we, we shouldn't say that, and maybe this is the next question you were going to ask, but if so, <laughs> I'll answer it anyway. So uh, uh, not all nudging is good. So many of you know that if people ask me to sign a copy of the book, I always sign it, Nudge for Good, which is a plea, not necessarily an expectation. And certainly there's a lot of private sector nudging that's pretty evil. And uh, I'll give you one example. When the first review of Misbehaving was published, my editor sent me a link that I clicked on and I ran into a paywall from the Times of London. And they, but there was an offer. I could have a one month trial for one pound. So I'm willing to pay a pound because the first couple sentences look friendly. So, uh, <laughs> and I'm myopic. So, but then, you know, I did write this other book. So I start reading the fine print and it turns out if you want to cancel, you have to give them 14 days notice. <laughs> so it's actually a two-week trial. And you can't do it online. You have to call London. <laughs> Not on a toll-free line. And during London business hours. So I wrote a column about this in the New York Times, and they made me play like a reporter. So I called the Times and asked them, to justify this policy. And they said, well, we don't want, we want to make sure people know all the benefits. Oh, I should mention that, of course, after the one month, they automatically enroll you into a subscription that costs 27 pounds a month. That's choice architecture? That's choice architecture. <laughs> and it's bad choice architecture. And I've coined a term for this which I call sludge. <laughs> now, the, the main principle of nudging is make it easy. That's my mantra. If you want people to do something, make it easy. Remove the barriers. So you automatically enroll people, they'll do it. If you automatically enroll them into something that they don't want, um, like if Cass had clicked on that link, he would still be a subscriber to, <laughs> I, I to the time. So yeah, yeah, yeah it's right. Really good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the cricket scores. I haven't read it, but yeah. I'm sure it's. Yeah, good. no, they have re re really good coverage of cricket. Um, I'm still getting uh, records uh, every month from Columbia. <laughs> uh, <laughs> exactly. So um, I. I uh, we've both been writing about this now. Cass has a new paper that uh, is longer than my New York Times column. And, um, you know, so we're, we would like to remove sludge. And it's not clear exactly how to do it. I, I think I was trying to convince some people at a large tech firm that they should have uh, essentially an extension to your web browser that will read all the fine print <laughs> and warn you. <laughs> because the EU passed some new regulations and exactly what it accomplished is add sludge. Because it now, whenever... I was just in London, it's very irritating. It, right? You yeah, just, super irritating. If, if anytime you're yeah. in Europe, you open up any publication and you have to agree to God knows what. <laughs> so that is not good regulation. It's not good choice architecture. And um, so you can absolutely uh, nudge for evil or for, uh, for profit. And uh, Bernie Madoff was a master of nudging. We didn't invent nudging. 
We just coined a term for it. Okay. Uh, one thing, I think we, we have only a couple minutes before we can, uh, we're going to take questions uh, from this terrific audience. But one thing I do want to drive into slightly more personal, and we have lots of students here who I think will be especially interested in this, is you know, one thing I deeply admire about both of you is that you seem unafraid of having ideas that run outside the conventional wisdom, let's call it. Uh, be it around nudges or questioning the assumptions underlying homo economicus. Uh, and I certainly saw Cass in the Obama administration time and again uh, not necessarily endear himself to his, his friends when he believed uh, deeply in something. So what, where did that come from? How do you guys nurture that? How do you protect it? And do you ever have moments when you're like, you know, it'd just be easier to just go along? There's the academic and then there's the non-academic. So if you're writing papers as a student or as an assistant professor or a professor, do you ever feel, and really talk to everyone in the room individually right now, that there's a kind of tickle, it's like here, <laughs> or some, something like that. And if uh, some of you are nodding or almost, and what, what's, that, that means, I think, or that you have something that's yours and that is uh, stirring you in some way, that's, it's almost like it makes you laugh or it makes you, the fingers have to either inquire or to produce something. And it, it could be in economics, it could be in law, it could be in any number of fields. And in terms of thinking about things, if you have that tingle or tickle, don't ignore it. Because what you spend your time on with that will be for you time really well spent. And chances are unusually good that you're going to end up doing something that's worthwhile. So whenever I get that, I think, you know, go for it. And uh, it's diagnostic, meaning chances are it's going to be OK. I had a book project in the last few years that had zero tingle or tickle. There wasn't a moment where I thought I'm almost laughing or I'm slightly obsessed. And that book, it's disintegrated. It's 80,000 words of horror. <laughs> <laughs> it's just terrible. So that's, that's one thing about writing something that's, that's you. Yes, I hope everyone that feels familiar. If you're lucky, it's once every six months. If you're you know, unlucky, it's once a year. But it's great, and go for it. Even if other people think that is horrible. And uh, okay, so Dick and I both experienced every other people think it's horrible. In, in terms of institutions, if there's something that you have conviction, humility, but conviction, it's going to make an institution better or help people. You know, there's nothing better or than to fight for it, even if your own uh, reputation is uh, suffering. So to do that, it's there's something thrilling about it, as well as really not thrilling about not doing it. No, Cass, that, that's very moving. It, I just want to point out it runs counter uh, to the advice that Homer gave Bart Simpson in one of the episodes. Uh, where he said, never, ever say anything unless you're absolutely certain everyone agrees. You're making me rethink. <laughs> Dick, do you want to talk about this? Um, well, I, I gave a commencement speech a few years ago at, where I argued that it was rational to choose careers based on fun. And... Uh, so I've, I've found coming up with these examples of people misbehaving to be lots of fun. Um, and then I, you know, got to... Even if all your friends didn't think it was fun when you found no, it. Uh, no, but, you know, like, pissing off Casey Mulligan is kind of fun. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, I came here 23 years ago with my eyes open. Um, and I mean, 98% of my colleagues 
um, over that period have engaged uh, in, I, I describe the University of Chicago as ruthlessly constructive. Now, there are, there are some that go beyond that. But uh, focus on the ruthless part. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> overdo the ruthless. But um, but you know my uh, golf buddy Gene Fama, who, uh, who we actually we're actually pretty good friends and frequent golf partners, and he he describes it as we agree about all the facts, we disagree about the interpretation, and um, uh, that allows us to get along pretty well and uh, enjoy each other's company. So, um, and if what you're doing is just like what Cass describes writing that book, then uh, find something else to do. You're all bright and talented, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you should all go become uh, artists, um, you know, uh, if you can do that and make a living, go for it. <laughs> but but there's no reason to do something that you hate. You're too talented for that. Find something that's at least a little fun and rewarding and self-fulfilling. It's easy to find something. Okay, last question, and then we're going to turn the floor. You only get 30 seconds for this one. How'd you guys find each other? Oh, that's easy. The, like the second day I was at the University of Chicago, Cass called me up. <laughs> and he said, I've been reading your papers, um, you know, and then I think uh, Noodles had a different name. <laughs> there was some prior in The Agora. Uh, it wasn't and, the Agora? No, no, there was another restaurant that's indistinguishable. Hmm? Okay, so anyway, <laughs> so yeah, he basically propositioned me. He propositioned me. Yeah. Here, here's what, what happened on, on my end. Was, uh, I was writing a paper as a young Chicago law professor on uh, departures from rationality. And I was really stumbling, but I, was, uh, I had the tingle. And in the, at the squash court right around the corner, I was playing with an economist named Stephen Chevelle, who's also a law professor, and I explained to him what I was working on, and he said, that sounds really horrible and <laughs> hopeless. There's a guy at Cornell <laughs> named Thaler who's also doing that, and, <laughs> and he said with some combination of admiration and disgust, he actually published something on it. <laughs> I didn't I fail or I didn't know, I thought it was OR at the end, but I went back and looked for it. I read his paper, Toward a Positive Theory of Consumer Choice, and it was like an explosion of light. It's a fantastic paper. Excellent. So it, it's, it's a love affair. <laughs> it is. You know, we both like our wives better, but, you know, and uh, I wouldn't want to live with him. You know. <laughs> Okay, I think we have time for a couple questions. Uh, there's a microphone floating around, or a couple microphones floating around. So if you can, if you're capable of standing up, stand up, because then we'll see you. Hi, thanks for joining us today. I had a question of, in the way that you've been talking about nudges, there's some nudges that are passive, the automatic enrollment whereas there are some nudges that are more active where you get a text message or an email. I was wondering how you conceptualize the, the potential overload if people are getting a lot of text messages, just blowing them up all the time about you should enroll in this educational program, et cetera, or, I mean, that's a silly example, but I was just curious what you were thinking about the potential to overload with the nudges. Yes. Okay, so it's a great question. So th there are some uh, nudges that work without enlisting the agency of the person who's being nudged. So if you are automatically enrolled in various programs at the University of Chicago, there's no overload risk, that's kind of a blessing. It doesn't require your attention. The disadvantage of it is if the nudger is uh, ill-motivated or confused, 
you may find yourself after the fact in something that you never assented to and that you never devoted your attention to. So that's not so good. The uh, educative or agency requiring nudges, like a calorie label or a reminder or a reference to social norms, those are also uh, nudges. They preserve freedom of choice. Um, they may be relaxing like a GPS is. They may be a little agitating like a calorie label is. Uh, those tax your limited resources in your, in your head. And you're right that there's a risk of, of ultimate overload. I think it would be a Black Mirror episode, which I'm <laughs> aspiring to write. Anyone here connected with the show, Black Mirror? <laughs> uh, where uh, someone is so overloaded by all the reminders and such that they stop paying attention or start spinning really fast like a top. That wouldn't be a good Black Mirror episode. <laughs> but the, 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 you're right, that this could be a, a, a kind of Kafka-esque vision. I think that would be science fiction more than reality. But the trade-off, the, the choice between uh, educative agency promoting nudges and non-educative, let's call life easing nudges, uh, often turns on considerations of the sort just discussed, which is does the agency promoting one lead people to think, oh my god, I have to d deal with this? Or does it lead them to focus on, on something and make a choice that's better than some external choice architect would make? Okay, underscoring how you guys have packed the house, there's a question up above. Okay, we see him. <laughs> um, so my question is, do you ever see a case where uh, the group being nudged can, like, in turn, nudge the group that's nudging? So, kind of a nudgeception, or <laughs> something. <laughs> or do, does this only work from like an authoritative position down, or do you ever see a case where it can work from the bottom up? Uh, well, you know, there are now, by somebody's count, 200 nudge units around the world. And uh, I was heavily involved with the one in the UK, and Cass was heavily involved with the one in the White House that somehow sort of has disappeared. I don't know exactly why. But now, but you know, it's not like we've been going out making that happen. It's just spread. And uh, that's encouraging. Um, you know. Things can go viral, but sometimes those are viruses. So, um... Okay, I think Kara was, yeah, there's a question. Uh, so as a parent, I'm wondering if you'd speak on the differences and similarities of nudging children versus nudging adults. Okay, so do you all know the difference between system one and system two? We refer in the book to humans who have system one, the automatic system and to, to econs who are all system two, and system two is the deliberative reflective. So I have a child, a little boy, as well as a little girl, but we'll talk about the boy for the moment, who when he was six, he's now nine, he was very focused on toys, and we'd pass toy stores, and the choice architecture was such that he'd say, must go in, must go in, and I explained to him the difference between system one and system two. <laughs> uh, as, as, as any good father would. <laughs> this is an educative... With footnotes. <laughs> your system one wants to get toys, but your system two knows <laughs> that you have plenty of toys, there's no need. And he nodded, and I thought, good parenting. <laughs> and then a month later, he turned to me as we were walking down the street and said, Daddy, do I even have a system two? <laughs> And I wasn't quick enough to say that you would uh, not have, that question is proof that you do. <laughs> but then I think I would have lost him to therapy forever. <laughs> uh, so it, it, there are informal things that parents intuitively do that involve defaults, that involve reference to social norms, that certainly involve reminders and information provision. And those can be uh, better sometimes than mandates and bans, partly because they give the child freedom of choice, which can be uh, important. 
and partly because they uh, give the child a sense of ownership of what the child ultimately chooses to do. On the, on the other hand, cell phone screen time limits are not the worst idea for children. Did we just discover your next book? Uh, Dick, shall we do it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have time for one last question. My question is to Professor Taylor. Uh, so the earlier research on behavioral finance or behavioral economics is as old as like 40 years old. Uh, but uh, academic, the, the academic attention is in the last couple of maybe five or 10 years. So do you think there was a like special event that triggered this attention? So I, well, I disagree with uh, your history. Uh, my first behavioral finance paper was published in 1985, and it caused an immediate furor, uh, especially here at the University of Chicago. Um, and the uh, because we it was written with a student, we had a the paper was called "Does the Stock Market Overreact?" and um, the all the PhD students were given the assignment to find our programming error because that was the leading hypothesis here as to how we could have come up with this result that said you can predict future returns with prior returns. So the surprising thing to me has been that the most successful branch of behavioral economics to date has been behavioral finance. I would have bet a, a thousand to one against that because financial markets are the, the ones where you'd least expect to find anomalies. Transaction costs are tiny, stakes are huge, um, but they have really good data and uh, very sharply specified null hypotheses that turn out to be false. So um, uh, Bob Schiller and I ran a NBER workshop on behavioral finance for 30 years. So it, it's been it's been going on a long time. You know, I'd say uh, pop culture has engaged in behavioral economics in the last decade, um, in part because of books like Nudge and Thinking Fast and Slow and lots and lots of others. But um, in, in, the, in academia, uh, it's, it's it, I'm not saying it was a wave, uh, but um, it was a strong ripple, <laughs> and uh, and it's been growing pretty steadily. There, there's no like moment where it happened. Put it this way: the Nobel Prize comes with an approximately 30-year lag. If you look at the prizes uh, in the last few years, they're mostly for work in the 1980s. So um, the it, the Swedes are slow, but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, intentionally slow. They they don't want to make type one errors, <laughs> uh, so they want to wait until they're convinced. And uh, but no, I I don't think it was it was sudden. Uh, I've been at it for 40 years. Cass, any final words? Reminiscing being back here in Chicago with Dick? Lunch tomorrow? Noodles, <laughs> still there. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, Dick Taylor and Cass. <laughs>